This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. And happy fall. Uh, we're happy to begin uh, this season uh, with an examination of one of the greatest resources we have here in Vermont. Uh, that's the Ropeby Museum. And my guest is Dr. Lindsay Varner, uh, the executive director of the Ropeby Museum, located in beautiful Ferrisburg, Vermont. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, first of all, as I like to do in all my shows, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a historian who specializes in uh, reformational history, in particular the history of Quakerism, which fits really well with Rokeby's history and the family's Quaker past. Um, I've worked in cultural heritage for over a decade, and I've been at Rokeby for four years now. I started in September of 2020, and it's been an incredible place to work. There's, It's, just, like you said, just an amazing resource for the states as well as the nation to understand the anti-slavery movement and the history of the Underground Railroad. We very, really are quite a special place um, and one that just continues to grow. Tell us about the museum, how it got started, and uh, also a little bit about the, the scope of it, the facilities and the grounds and, and anything you can tell us. Yeah, so the museum has been around since the 1960s. There were four generations of the Robinson family that lived at Rokeby's. So from 1793 until 1961, there was a Robinson living at Rokeby. And when the last Robinson passes away, Elizabeth Donaway Robinson, she hands over the site to what was then called the Rowland Evans Robinson Memorial Association. And that was an organization that formed in the 1930s to honor our third generation Robinson. So the son of our abolitionist, Rowland Evans Robinson. And that organization did readings of his writings. He was a very well-known author in the 19th and early 20th century. They did art shows of the family's artwork. The third and fourth generations were incredibly talented artists um, and did art professionally. And so this organization became the start of the museum at Rokeby. So currently at the museum, we have a historic house, which was the house the Robinsons lived in. We have a number of historic farm buildings that related to the time when the uh, site was being used as a farm. And we have two modern buildings on the property. One is our education center, which houses our exhibitions. We have one main exhibit that focuses on the anti-slavery movement and the Underground Railroad. And we have a seasonal exhibit space where we can rotate out stories and exhibitions to further tell the history at Rokeby. Um, our other modern space is a collections building because that is a big part of the work that we do at the museum is maintain the collections and the materials that belong to the family. Well, tell us about the Robinson family. Uh, who are, are they? Uh, what did they do? Where they came from? And a little bit of information on uh, the founders, I guess. Yeah, the Robinsons were um, quite an incredible family. Um, so they came to Vermont from Newport, Rhode Island in the 1790s. Uh, initially, they're living in Virgins and they came with money. Um, they were buying and selling land. They had owned a number of mills and eventually they purchased the property that is today Rokeby. Um, we talk about in our exhibitions about where that money came from, and we do know that earlier generations of the family were involved in the slave trade in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, they had been enslavers, they had been a part of the slave triangle of trade, um, and some of that money is what allowed our Robinsons to move to Vermont and to begin setting up their farm. Um, and we talk a lot about that and the irony of what brought them to Vermont and what made them wealthy, um, and then their abolitionist history as well by the time you get to the second generation here in Vermont. So that's a big part of the story that we tell here um, and recognizing the importance of understanding where the family's wealth came from. That first generation that came, um, Thomas Robinson was one of the first uh, farmers to import Merino sheep into Vermont. And so Merino sheep helped to make the family even wealthier. Um, and uh, they eventually go on to have an orchard on the property with 76 different varieties of apples and pears. 
Um, they had a nursery and were selling apples and pear trees and cherry trees. Um, and then the second generation, as I said, um, are our most nationally significant story here at the museum. Um, they were nationally known abolitionists. They utilized this site as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, and we are very lucky to have a collection of letters at the museum. Um, they're actually held on uh, permanent loan to Middlebury College archives. And it's 15,000 letters across four generations. And among those, there's some incredible correspondence that helps to document the anti-slavery movement. It is an incredibly rare and one-of-a-kind collection. Um, the son of our abolitionist, Roland Evans Robinson, um, he's the reason we really exist as a museum. He was an author, he was an artist, and he was nationally known for the books that he wrote. Um, probably uh, most famous known for his books on the Danvis Tales, a fictional Vermont town with um, stories of Vermont life in a small village. Um, and then his children were artists, and we have a great collection of art. So we do a little bit of everything. We call them the A's, um, abolition, arts, agriculture, and advocacy. That's great. Well, what does the name Rokeby come from? Yeah, we're not entirely sure why the family started calling it Rokeby. Um, so Rokeby is a poem written by Sir Walter Scott. It was wildly popular in the 19th century. If you look up Rokeby, there are Rokebys all over the world. People named their house Rokeby. Um, we're not sure why they started calling it that. It was probably after the poem. Um, but at some point in the 19th century, they started calling it Rokeby, and we decided to continue that on. That's great. Well, the, the museum is a National Historic Landmark, is it not? That is correct, yes. So what does that mean? How does that uh, impact uh, on your operation? So it doesn't really impact our operations, but it does give us a designation that we are a site of National Historic Significance. So not only are we important to understanding the history of Vermont, but the stories that we tell here at Rokeby help to give people a better understanding of the United States history. And so our National Historic Landmark comes from the abolitionist and anti-slavery history here at the museum. And through that designation, we are considered one of the best documented underground railroad sites in the nation. That's amazing. And, and how does Vermont connect with this? It, you know, it seemed that slaves would be running away from the South, uh, it, it's, a, it's a long way. Uh, I, I guess we're the, the last port of call uh, before Canada. Uh, tell us how, how that operated during the Civil War, before the Civil War. Yeah, and we have, despite being one of the best documented sites, there's not a lot of documentation as to what happened to the freedom seekers that were coming through. Um, we do know that some freedom seekers were coming to Rokeby and they would work. So they would earn a living, save up enough money, and presumably go someplace else. But we really can't trace what happens to the freedom seekers after they leave Rokeby. Um, the Abolitionist and Underground Railroad Network is this kind of loose network of individuals. And freedom seekers would be traveling in all different directions. You know, they could go north, they could go south, they could go west. They were traveling and all over. Um, and we know that other abolitionists would be sending freedom seekers to Rokeby. And based on our documentation, they could stay for hours, they could stay for days, they could stay longer. Um, sometimes they would go to other houses within the network in Vermont um, before heading on to Canada. But it's not terribly clear. It is, in a sense, secretive. Um, so we have some ideas and can piece together some of that story. Um, but we don't know a lot. And so when people come to the museum and ask us how many freedom seekers came through on the Underground Railroad, we can just kind of say we're not sure, but we can uh, at least trace 11 people who set foot on this site, but we cannot say what happened to any of them after they left. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the uh, new exhibitions that you have at the museum. Yeah, so this year in May, we opened a brand new main exhibition called Seeking Freedom. And this explores the anti-slavery and the Underground Railroad history here at the museum. We had spent you know, a number of years asking people to give us feedback on our previous main exhibit. 
And we learned a lot about what people wanted to learn and how they wanted to continue on the conversations around the anti-slavery movement. So this new exhibit focuses on the early years of the history of enslavement, how it started in the US, the history of race-based slavery in the United States, and then explores the freedom seekers that we have documentation on in our collection. And it goes the whole way through to understanding the anti-slavery movement in the US, the Robinson family, and their roots in enslavement in Rhode Island, to bringing the story up to the present. And that was something the public really wanted to know more about. How does the story continue after emancipation? So our final gallery in the exhibit um, explores the next generations of the Robinson family, and it also uh, it features three organizations and the work that they're doing uh, in Vermont to help to continue the advocacy that was started in, back in the 19th century. And you also have uh, seasonal exhibitions. Tell us about those. Yeah, every year we rotate out our seasonal exhibitions. This year we have Artifacts and Antidotes. And this was a really fun exhibit to put together. It was co-curated by our volunteers. We asked our volunteers to share stories of the museum or of the Robinson family or artifacts that we have in the collection that typically we don't get to share with the public. And so it's this really fun collection of things that don't seem to fit together, but their underlying theme is that our volunteers love the stories that you can share from them. So it's everything from textiles and um, like hats and coats um, to a section that we call all the small things, those little bits of ephemera in the collection that are so tiny, you often don't get to put out on display, but we did for this exhibit. So it's a really fun way of exploring the museum through the objects that belong to the family. That's great. Tell us about some of the fall activities that are coming up. Yeah, so our next big fall activity is going to be Spirits of Rokeby. So this is a program that we've been doing the past few years based off of the spiritualist papers that we have in the collection. So it doesn't seem like it's connected, but our abolitionist generation and um, spiritualism are intimately tied together. So our uh, Robinsons, the first two generations were Quakers. Our abolitionists, the second generation, eventually leave Quakerism over the question of immediate emancipation. The Robinsons believed that slavery needed to end right away. And in the 1850s, they turn to spiritualism and they start to get very involved in seances. Um, one of the um, people that lived here on and off, Anne King, kept detailed notes of the seances that she attended. And we have a great transcript of communications between our Robinsons and deceased Robinsons. So all of this has become uh, inspiration for Spirits of Rokeby. So it's a participatory play held inside the house. And we have time tickets for people to come in um, and get to experience a little bit of what it was like to be a part of a seance in the 19th century. Wow. And, uh, you know, that might be of interest nationally with all the coast to coast uh, AM type shows and, and, and things like that. Uh, and when is that going to be running? So that is October 25th and 26th. Um, it, tickets will be up sometime this week on the website for people to buy. Uh, because we hold this inside the historic house, we do have very limited tickets for each time slot. So I recommend people buy early. We sell out every single year. Wow. And I don't know if we mentioned it. Give us an idea of the hours and, and the days of the museum. Yeah, so the museum is open May to October, and we're open seven days a week from 10 to 5. We do historic house tours. So currently, the house is only open for tours. We have it set up just as if the Robinsons were living in it. So there is stuff everywhere that belonged to the Robinsons. So we run tours every day except for Tuesdays at 11 and 2. Great. Uh, after this exhibit uh, that you mentioned, is there going to be any other exhibits uh, towards the end of the year? No. So artifacts and antidotes will go until October 13th. So it'll see us out through the season. And then next year, there will be a new exhibition put together. That's great. One of the uh, things I, I think uh, is mentioned about advocacy, uh, what types of advocacy activities uh, does the museum engage in or help people who are interested in doing that kind of work? 
Yeah, so we believe in supporting other organizations and the work that they are doing. That was part of the idea of highlighting modern organizations in the new exhibit. And we were going to rotate that out every couple of years in order to feature the work of organizations in Vermont. Um, we also believe that history plays a very important role in understanding our present. Um, if you don't understand the past, it is really hard to understand what is happening in your communities today. And so that is an important role that as a historical institution, we can play in our communities. So we do a lot of talks and lectures. We partner with other organizations. This is something we're very passionate about, and we want to work to continue to support the work of um, nonprofits and organizations across the state. That's great. One of the things we like to focus in is what do you need uh, in terms of support? Uh, and you have a membership program. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, we are a membership institution, so you can join the museum and become a member. We have different tiered levels based on what it is individuals can give. New this year, we started a partnership with the North American Reciprocal Museum Program called NARM. Um, and if you join at our Rowland and Rachel Society level, you get a NARM card. And that'll get you into museums all across North America. Um, it's been a very popular choice for members. We've actually had a lot of people coming into the museum this year who are also NARM members uh, that have their cards. So if you are a member of NARM, you get into the museum for free, you get all of the discounts that our members at that same level get as well. So we really encourage people to join if they like to travel and visit other museums who are on the network. Um, we also have uh, an annual fund that will be coming up in the fall, and that is one of our largest fundraisers of the year. Um, it really helps to support our day-to-day -day operations of the museum. So from keeping our lights on to paying the heat to paying staff, um, it is a great way to support the museum. And there'll be information for that on our website in the coming weeks. Um, but we're always looking for project support. We have a yearly sponsorship campaign, which you can find right on our website. Um, we are currently looking for sponsors for Spirits of Rokeby, um, but that, those are great ways to support the museum and the work that we're doing. That's great. And what about volunteers? Uh, do you have a need for volunteers? Or better yet, tell us what volunteers do uh, and help at the facility. Yeah, so we are a small staff. We have two full-time staff members and one seasonal staff member. So volunteers do so much work at the museum to help us running on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, volunteers can do anything from buildings and grounds work, helping us on our trails, working um, around the site, helping to clean up flower beds. Um, we also, all of our tours at the museum are done by volunteers. So if somebody is interested in becoming a tour guide for next season, we start training over the winter and first tours start Mother's Day weekend in May of 2025. Um, so we're looking for guides all the time to help support our tours. Uh, we also have a lot of collections work happening at the moment. And so volunteers can work in our collections. They can help catalog books. We're working to move things into a new collection storage building. So we're going to need help with that. So depending on your interests, there are lots of different ways to get involved at Rokeby. That's great. And uh, in terms of uh, plans for the future for next year, do you have any uh, ideas in mind uh, after this season ends and you, what do you do between seasons? That's, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. So in the winter, it is actually a really busy period for us. So in the summers, we're very much focused on the opening. So it's, you know, that outward, getting the buildings open, working with the public, covering the front desk. And then the winter is our planning season. That is when we have the opportunity to really start thinking about what the next year is going to look like. So we uninstall the current seasonal exhibit, start working on installing the next exhibit. Uh, we start working on setting a program calendar, getting everything together in terms of funding and sponsorships. That is all happening behind the scenes during the winter. So it's a very busy time for us. It's also a great time for us to do collections because we don't have a lot of space at the museum. So when we're closed, we can spread out, have tables all over the galleries and the house. We can have volunteers working to get the collections sorted. Um, but we also do some programming in the winter. So I recommend to keep an eye on our website or to join our newsletter. We have a holiday open house in December. We do virtual book groups in January, February, and March. 
And we always do a virtual lecture in February for Black History Month. So I recommend keeping an eye on our calendars as those start to unfold. And what's the website? www.ropeb.org. Excellent. That's simple enough. And do you have a, a telephone number people could call? Yeah, so it's 802-877-3406. And if you go to our website, you will see a link for our newsletter and you can sign up for that. And that goes out every two weeks. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that sounds very good. And, and maybe we'll uh, certainly have you back in a, in a, uh, when activities get uh, going uh, and you open again uh, next year. But you're, you've got some uh, great stuff going on between now and the end of the season. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks you for preparing up positively for more. Um, thank you. This is Dennis McMahon, and you've been watching Positively Vermont. Uh, Lindsay Varner, the executive director of the Rope Bee Museum in Ferrisburg, Vermont. Thank you very much.